Hello and welcome to T.C. Williams High School. My name is Mark Eaton and we're here in the television studio at T.C. Williams for an unscripted press conference featuring 16 student journalists from our Journalism One class. Our guest today is Alexandria's Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Gregory Hutchings. Dr. Hutchings is an Alexandrian, uh, a graduate of T.C. Williams High School. He worked in the administration uh, here at, uh, in Alexandria and then became the superintendent at, uh, at Shaker Heights, Ohio. He's back uh, at a lively time for uh, Alexandria. We're uh, going to have an unscripted press conference today. Our journalists will be asking questions and Dr. Hutchings will be responding. It should be a very interesting time. So without, uh, without more, Dr. Hutchings, welcome to TC. Thank you, and welcome, everybody. It's so great to see our young people here, and I'm looking forward to answering any of your questions today. So who's going to be the first person? Hi, I'm Nikki Harris. I'm a freshman. Hello, Nikki. Um, should there be a mandatory retirement age for teachers? Should there be a mandatory retirement age for teachers? Absolutely not. Mr. Kokonis is still here, right? And the fact that he is still able to share his knowledge with so many of our young people, I think is, is remarkable. If, if someone still has the ability to teach young people and the desire, then so be it, right? I feel like you should be able to teach as long as you want. Thank you. Um, I'm Rachel Wilson, a freshman. Hey, Rachel. Nice to meet you. Um, though TC already has an AP program, do you think they could benefit from an IB program? So, you know, that's a question that I used to get a lot in Shaker Heights because mm -hmm. Shaker Heights is an international baccalaureate school division, but it also had AP courses. And the one thing I would always tell people, and I believe it here as well, is that AP and IB can live under one roof. It really depends on options for kids. You know, if our student population wanted to pursue or be, be able to have options to do international baccalaureate courses here at T.C. Williams, and I think we should pursue um, that path. But if they don't, then let's not. You know, I think that if we really want to provide um, alternative or multiple pathways for students to obtain their high school diploma, and it can be through AP or IB. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Taylor Motzinger. I'm a freshman. Hello. You said Taylor? Yeah. Nice to meet you, Taylor. Nice to meet you. Should TC's names name be changed due to the raci racist history associated with it? That is a really good question. <laughs> so when I think of Thomas Chamberlain Williams, right, and um, that is who TC Williams is, right? He was the superintendent who was probably one of our most racist superintendent, and he was also superintendents, and he's also he was also a bigot, right? <laughs> Um, I get this question often, and I really don't believe we should change the name. You know, I think that when you look at history and you think of all of the buildings who are named after people who either owned slaves or people who um, were racist during that particular time of history, uh, that we would be changing a whole lot of buildings and a lot of streets all over this country. And can we really do that, right? So how do you pick and choose who was the bigger racist or not, right? A racist is a racist. And um, many buildings and unfortunately streets are already named after so many of them, so that doesn't change anything. But what I do say to this question is that now we do have a superintendent uh, who is sitting in the same seat as T.C. Williams, uh, who happens to be African American. And we happen to now have a school named after him that has 114 countries represented and 119 languages. And that, to me, is the biggest slap in the face that we could ever do, right? Before, without changing the name. Like, we're showing, we're taking your name, and we are wearing your name, and people that you didn't want to even step foot into the schools um, right here in our city because of the color of their skin, they are now proud graduates of T.C. Williams, and I'm one of them. Uh, so I say that that is the biggest way for us to get back uh, at, at T.C. Williams. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Grace Williams. I'm a freshman. Hello, Grace. Hi. Um, what are you planning to do to get the key concepts of the high school project through to the students of Alexandria? So to get the key concepts of the high school project through, help me understand what that question means. Basically incorporating it into some sort of, ba basically telling the students um, what it's all about and how they can help. Towards Got it. it. So how do I get the students engaged? Yes. Right. Um, so one big thing that we're actually working on right now, and uh, I had an opportunity to meet with the superintendent student advisory committee yesterday. And uh, during that time, we um, one of our topics of, dis of discussion was the high school project. And one thing that came out of that session that I went back into, you know, central office saying, we have to do this to get our kids engaged, is the fact that we really need to come to T.C. Williams during lunch, and we need to get groups of students to talk with us about one high school or two high schools, and we need to provide them with a special lunch, <laughs> right? Whether it's Chick-fil-A or Chipotle <laughs> or Duck Donuts or whatever, right? To get them to come and talk with us and just have a casual conversation on that particular topic and let's just gather data to see what comes out of that. You know, that's one of many ways. We also heard from our students yesterday, um, this is the superintendent's advisory um, committee, and they said that we need to use social media a little more um, to engage our students, whether it's Snapchat or Instagram or Twitter or even Facebook. Even though I know a lot of our high school students are not on Facebook, um, but that's just another avenue that we can possibly engage um, our, our young people. And those are some of the you know, communications channels that we would like to use to help engage our students. And we need to have students kind of leading students and not just the adults coming in to talk with our students. Like, I mean, you all have so much knowledge, like so much more. You're far ahead, I believe, than most adults because you live and breathe this world, right? You only know iPhones, <laughs> right? I know there was a time where I didn't have a cell phone at all. So the way that you all think, what you all are looking for in regards to the future, uh, it's gonna be so beneficial um, to us. So that's just an idea of how we're gonna engage you all in this process for the high school project. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, do you think students from Alexandria should be allowed to attend Thomas Jefferson High School? You know, that question came up to me one time this year, right? I was thinking I was gonna get more questions about that. And um, my response to the, the person who sent me this email was a few months ago, was that I really believe that we offer a state-of-the-art STEM um, curriculum here at, at TC Williams, and that we're able to provide or afford our young people with these experiences, very similar experiences to what they can get at Thomas Jefferson. Um, I bring up Anna Humphreys, right, because of the fact that we were able to have a student right here out of T.C. Williams, who's, you know, spent her time in Alexandria City Public Schools, uh, who is now, like, known nationally, $250,000, I mean, like an award, and she's not a T.J. graduate. I mean, she is a T.C. Williams graduate, and I think that that in itself is giving us proof that it is possible for us to provide our young people um, with a very lucrative um, and rich uh, STEM experience. Do we have room to grow in that area? Absolutely, just like we do in other areas, right? I think that we can always enhance and refine the work that we're doing here, but I know that we can provide our young people in their city and in their community a solid um, STEM curriculum. Thank you. I didn't get your name. <laughs> Nikki, nice to meet you, Nikki. Hi, I'm Abigail Ernst, I'm a freshman. How do you feel about uh, dual enrollment students taking the AP exam? So dual enrollment students, and these are students who are taking college courses as well, um, and them taking the AP exam, mm -hmm. well, why not, <laughs> right, is what I think. But I know that the college board, they may have their own policies and procedures in regards to that. Personally, I think that, you know, students are showing um, college prep because they're taking a college course, an actual college course, um, mm -hmm. similar to what an advanced placement course is like. So I think that if they are able to, you know, pass the AP exam, so so be it. But we would need to 
uh, look at what the college board's policies and procedures are in regards to the, uh, the AP exam. I think they probably would have some questions about that because they would say, well, now they're not taking an AP course and they're able to just take this AP exam without the course, um, which would most likely be some concerns to them. But I feel that college level work is college level work and uh, students should be able to. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Stella Williams. I'm a Hello. freshman. Nice to meet you. How do you plan to decrease truancy at TC? How do we plan to decrease truancy at TC? Uh, well, you know, I think that if kids will come to school if we make it a place that you want to be, right? So I think that we have to continue to find what are those specific, you know, uh, whether they're activities or experiences that our young people want to have uh, in this building to, to draw them into our school. Right? And I think that is what's going to get them here. Uh, and then once we get them here, so we get them hooked and we get them coming to school, how do we keep them engaged throughout the day so that they understand that it is meaningful, it's purposeful, and their experience at T.C. Williams is going to help them w with whatever they choose to do uh, in their future. But I think engagement is going to be key and determining what is it that makes you want to come to school so that we can make it a place you know, not just of learning, but a place where you feel, hey, this is the place that I need to be during the school day. And then how do we find ways for our young people um, to have some alternative options on how they do school? So for example, some kids may just need a half a day, right? And they may wanna do something else like work for the other part of the day. We need to be able to offer options like that so that we are customizing the instructional experience or the educational experience uh, for our young people. And I think that will definitely uh, tackle some of our truancy concerns. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Hello. I'm Jemana Hamid, and I'm a sophomore. Jemana. Um, what are your plans to make TC a more sustainable and a green environment? For example, um, like more clean kitchens and more clean bathrooms? Yes. So I, one, I think that's a, good, a great question. I, I know that when TC, this current TC was built, um, was, it, was it 2008? So about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago. Um, you know, we were really keeping that whole le lead and uh, green um, mentality. Uh, as a p at the forefront, excuse me, when we were building the school. I think us educating our students on environmental issues and how, you know, we can, meaning that our young people in our schools, that they can also be a part of ensuring that we're eco-friendly and that we're making, you know, wise economic and environmental decisions for today uh, is going to be key. I also think making sure that we are looking like, for example, our recycling program. And this is something that I've heard throughout my entire um, year, this first year here as superintendent, that people see recycle bins and they use them just like normal trash cans, right? No one understands the difference between a recycle bin and a trash can. And that's meaning that we haven't educated people on that. And we need to start talking to our young people as well as our adults about the implications of not saving our earth right and us just damaging and you know having this excessive water and not doing composting and you know things of that nature i think could really help us um, as we move forward with being just more eco-friendly and um how can you uh, like what are your plans for the kitchens specifically because how to have more like healthy foods yes. for the kids so one thing that um which is very interesting you bring that up because uh, our school nutritional office we're having discussions right now on how do we hire a chef to come in and help us put our menus together so that our so that our meals are healthier for our young people um, and not only are they healthier but because we have 114 countries represented that we offer options for um, you know, for our students that may have s certain cultural boundaries or, you know, certain types of foods that they may not eat based on religious or cultural purposes. Um, so how do we make sure we still provide them with food um, that they're going to want to eat here in our schools? Uh, so our school nutrition office is actually working now to enhance uh, how we do our menu options uh, within our schools to make them not only healthier, 
uh, but also more options for all of our young people. Okay, thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? How, um, how are you? Marquis Stone Dowdy, I'm a sophomore. Okay. And Marquis. my question is, um, how do you view teen vaping at TC Williams? Teen vaping, oh my gosh. So a teen vaping, you know, th those are the, elect the electric cigarettes, right? Um, with the, a lot of the smoke that comes out. One, you know, smoking and smoking is really how I feel in schools. I, I genuinely believe that, especially having my daughter come here next year, she's gonna be a ninth grader here at TC. And, um, I think there's a there's a place and there's a time for that and school is not the place and time for vaping. And I know currently in our school board policy it talks about, you know, smoking on campus or smoking in our buildings. Um, vaping is, you know, it's it's an iteration of, of smoking and it should be prohibited from our schools as well. Um, so I, I, I don't agree with vaping uh, in schools. And I think that it needs to be viewed upon the same way that we look at cigarettes in, uh, in our schools. How old do you have to be to vape? Can you go buy a vape? So you have to be legally 18, got it. So it's the same rules as like cigarettes then, okay. Hey, my name is Karen Pippen Mother, and I'm a freshman. And my question is that overcrowding has become a big topic in recent years, especially with the high school project that you guys are working on. But what do you think are some short term, maybe fixes to the problem that we could use in TC Williams and Minnie Howard? So, you know, I think that um, the biggest thing in regards to, you know, overcrowding uh, is, is the high school project. The fact that we have a high school project now in place is saying that we're taking the necessary efforts to move forward um, to make sure that we are preparing for the student population that is increasing here at TC Williams as well as throughout the school division. Um, some other things that have been taken in place is our redistricting that happened, you know, about a year ago um, at the elementary schools uh, here in ACPS to prepare um, for the student enrollment increases that have been happening over the past uh, several years. And then I think looking at some of the alternative pathways for students to obtain their high school diploma. Um, so for example, some kids take classes right now at our satellite campus. Uh, that is an option for students to not take classes here at the King Street campus um, or even at the Minnie Howard campus, but they're over at Braddock Place, where is where is, which is where our central office is located, and they're taking their classes um, in a blended learning environment that is some online and some direct instruction that happens uh, during that time. We're also having discussions right now with Northern Virginia Community College and trying to finalize an early college program where students will take classes on the campus of our community college. And that, was, that will be from ninth through 12th grade. And not only will they obtain their high school diploma, but they will also obtain an associate's degree uh, when they graduate from, from TC Williams. Uh, so these are some of the kind of like low hanging fruit that we're working on to address um, our capacity issues. Uh, but the main thing really is around the high school project as a whole. And how do we ensure every single one of our students have access and also are engaged in a high quality learning environment and that they have multiple pathways uh, to obtain their high school diplomas. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Hello. Taylor Motzinger, I'm a freshman. So um, la uh, last year in GW, there again, like you were saying, um, we need to focus on being eco-friendly. A lot of people either didn't know how to recycle or a lot of people said that, that um, GW just didn't recycle. So um, I know that a TC does recycle, but how, what are you doing to um, help recycling, recycling be prominent in GW? Yes, yeah, so we're making it a priority for our entire school division that regardless of which school we're at, we are part of a recycling program. And that does require us to educate our staff as well. So one thing that we have been doing is educating our facilities department 
uh, because our custodians who are who interact mostly with you know with our trash and our trash cans and things of that nature just a part of their responsibilities and uh, just making sure that we understand you know recycling bins don't have trash bags right and I learned that from a session I went to in the city the city offers kind of courses to help you understand how to recycle and I even learned some things and I've been recycling for a while but I didn't know that you know you shouldn't put actual trash bags in a recycle bin at home right they said that that actually clogs their recycling equipment and they end up just kind of putting that into it like another bin and it actually doesn't get recycled um, so the more we can educate not only our staff but also our students on the benefits of recycling I think people will take advantage of it a lot more and that is you know my my goal is that we just educate our staff and our students and that it is non-negotiable we don't have a choice but to recycle across all of our schools in Alexandria City Public Schools Hi, Nikki Hello. again. Yes. Um, what are you doing to reduce turnover of principals? Yes, that's a good question. You know, um, especially since the fact that we've had so many principals and so many superintendents, right? Because I'm the fourth one in five years, which is a problem, I believe. Uh, so I think the best way for us to retain not only our principals, but our instructional leaders is making sure that we invest in them, that we value them. Um, that we build capacity, meaning professional capacity with them, and that we invest not only in dollars, right, so making sure that we have competitive salaries that we're offering um, for these positions, but that we're investing in regards to extra, um, you know, learning opportunities or obtaining, whether it's a doctorate through our school, um, school division and a partnership with any of our local colleges or universities and making sure that we have onboarding uh, for our leaders, meaning when they say yes to working in Alexandria City Public Schools that we provide the appropriate mentorship um, for them and the appropriate guidance so that they can navigate Alexandria City Public Schools successfully. Um, and that can be through executive coaching or through mentorship programs that we're looking to offer. We're um, actually in the works right now or in the process of finalizing um, our leadership coaching model um, that will go into place next year. And this was a part of our push to help us retain uh, our instructional leaders, including our principals uh, within our schools. Thank you. You're welcome. Grace again. Yes, um, Grace. What inspired you to become part of the school system? Was it always something you knew you wanted to pursue? So I wouldn't say that it was always something <laughs> I wanted to, I knew I wanted to pursue because when I was a student here at T.C. Williams, a long time ago, I graduated in 95, um, I thought that I was gonna be a marketing major um, in college. And then I thought I was gonna be a doctor. I thought I was gonna be a forensic pathologist. So I went through a whole lot of <laughs> you know, job, jobs that I thought I was gonna do. Um, but when I was uh, an admissions counselor for Old Dominion University right out of college, uh, I met this woman, her name was Joyce Sigmundson, and she was a principal. And she was looking for a college for her son. And she came to me and she said, you would be a really good teacher. Have you ever thought about going into education? And uh, I said, well, I have a degree in math and science education. I could teach, you know, hey, give me your card. Maybe I'll call you sometime. And uh, a few months later, I gave her a call, and that was when I got hired as a teacher. And I think when I got into the classroom, um, I still remember the first day, like standing in front of our young people. I taught fifth grade, and um, I was like, oh my God, I'm responsible for like the world, is what I felt like, because these kids are gonna go out into the world one day and be the next generation of leaders. And it gave me like this sense of pride and excitement and nervousness, you know, um, all in one. And that's when I realized education was definitely gonna be the career path uh, for me. And as I matriculated throughout, you know, from a teacher to assistant principal, um, to principal, to director, I knew that the superintendency was gonna be, you know, the next, the next step for me. And um, being able to come back to Alexandria became a goal when I aspired to become a superintendent because I felt that I had so many educators who literally touched my life from kindergarten through 12th grade in Alexandria City Public Schools and paved the way for me and I stand on their shoulders today that 
you know, it was my responsibility to make sure that I do the same. Um, and that, you know, I extend that hand back to the community that made me the person I am today. Uh, so that's why I'm back. You know, I, I think that it's great to be one back home uh, and then two, to be able to help, you know, break down barriers and obstacles for the next generation so that you all can do anything you choose to do the same way, you know, people did uh, before me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Rachel Wilson again. Yes, Rachel. Um, because of recent events in schools, school safety has been talked about a lot, and I was wondering if there's any precautions that you want to take to ensure safety among ACPS schools. Yes, I want us to continue to, uh, one, it's a great question, and it is a hot topic right now. Um, I want us to continue to make sure that we're constantly re revising or refining our safety plans. Uh, because, you know, as time evolves, there are a lot more kind of strategies and practices that are out there. And I just want to make sure we're up to date on those. And we work really closely with the Alexandria Police Department. Um, I, fortunately, I get to meet with uh, Chief Brown, you know, throughout the year as well and talk, talk about some of our safety concerns or safety practices that we need to put in place. Um, but that constant collaboration is something I think is definitely going to be key for us to continue to provide a safe environment for our young people and just keeping safety as a priority you know not losing our focus on the fact that if kids are not safe in their schools you're not going to learn and if we have to keep that at the top of our priority list mm -hmm. uh, and ensuring that every day you come to school and your parents or your guardians you know allow you to come into this building and we're responsible for you that we're doing everything within our power to protect you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Taylor Hello. Motzinger. Yes. Um, do you think that reducing meat in school lunches could um, benefit our schools because reducing meat would be more eco-friendly and um, the meat industry emits more CO2 into our air than all of the transportation industries combined? Wow, that was a deep question. You know, I think that one is a tough one. And I say that because, um, you know, as we try to respect everybody's religious beliefs or everyone's personal beliefs around whether meat is good or bad, you know, some people are like, as much meat as you can give me is what I want, right? You know, some people think that way. And I think you gotta have a balance, of course. Um, but I think that it would take, we would be um, taking things too far if we didn't offer options like meat in the schools um, or if we didn't offer things that people just expect to eat each day you know um, in our schools and then when I talked about our nutritional program earlier and trying to make sure yeah. that um, we're customizing our menu options so that we're meeting you know d different individuals cultural needs or religious beliefs um, some people need to have meat it's good protein. There are other ways you can get protein too, but uh, so I think it would be difficult for us to to tackle that one. Um, but I do think it's important for us to educate um, our community on you know lean meat and uh, you know certain types of meats that we do have in the schools and making sure at least they're healthy if you're choosing to to be a meat eater or carnivore. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Hello. Sophie Lennon is senior. Uh, I was wondering how we can ensure that all students are put in the proper grade level. So how can we ensure all students are put in the proper grade level? So elaborate on that one a little bit. As more in, for, for example, there's a senior and she cannot do basic math, um, cannot read well or write well, and she's supposed to be graduating next year, I mean next month. So how can we ensure that all students, instead of having like you pass this test here you go into the next grade level how can we ensure that like um we are more um like more strict and making sure that they actually know the material and can go on to the next level mm -hmm. with that knowledge yeah so i think you know what really comes from that is um the question regarding equity mm -hmm. right 
And for, for, for the school division, equity is about meeting our students where they are and not necessarily where we want them to be. And with that, uh, that means that if we have students that are not reading, it is important for us to meet them where they are and provide the necessary supports so that they can get to where we need them to be. Because if you can't read, you can't learn, right? And I think that, you know, a part of our assessing kids, and it's not that, I, that my, um, you know, that I advocate testing, you know, overload, but I think assessment does have a place, you know, in education because it allows us to see where kids are, you know, and if they're making progress academically. And what I think we need to be able to do is when we're assessing students and we're seeing that they're performing below um, proficiency levels, that we are putting support plans in place so that they don't continue to get further and further behind. Um, I think that we need to have summer learning opportunities for our students to catch up and after school opportunities. Um, one thing I foresee in the future for us is having tutoring centers um, in all of our buildings throughout Alexandria City Public Schools that is free for all of our students um, who need them. And that we also have summer learning experiences for all students who are performing below proficiency levels. And it, that it is not um, a kind of like option for you, but it is required so that and not that it's punishment either. The goal is that, you know, I think when people, and that's why I'm not calling it summer school, because then it sounds like I gotta go to school or something, <laughs> you know? But a summer learning experience will allow students to still have some fun while they're catching up. Some kids are gonna need to catch up. And the only time we can do that uh, for many cases is during the summer. So we don't wanna miss those opportunities. And we need to make those opportunities mandatory for kids performing below proficiency levels. And I think if we incorporate that uh, into you know, our academic beliefs in Alexandria City Public Schools, we will see uh, our achievement gap narrowing and we'll see more students graduating um, within four years here at TC Williams. Okay, um, as a follow-up question, our teachers have a lot of impact on how we learn and how we um, succeed in life in general. So how can we make sure that the teachers that are in TC are committed to their students and don't, um, don't just work here as a paycheck. They're actually committed to making yes. sure students pass. Yes, and I think that you know that that is a philosophy I th we need to have for all of our employees, right? And that is the number one reason we should be in this work, and this is one of the number number one reasons I'm in this work is for our kids, for our students, right? You all should be our top priority, and if you you know are in this business to get a check, you know this is not the right school division to work in. And I think we're gonna have to continue to set those expectations. Um, one thing that we've done this year was that for our interview process for teachers, this year we've incorporated a new um, interview process uh, that is consistent across the school division. Um, this requires multiple um, stakeholders to be a part of the interview process for teachers. It also requires teachers to do some form of demo um, kind of lesson. So they're showing that they know how to teach with our own kids, right? When kids are available to be in a classroom for them to teach in front of. Uh, so it gives them an opportunity to one, see the population that we serve here in the city of Alexandria. And then two, for us to see what type of teacher they are, right? And it's not that we need to have cookie cutter teachers and every teacher should do the same thing because you should bring your own personality, your own style um, to the teaching environment because I believe it's an art as well. Um, but we need to have some clear expectations that students have to be the number one priority um, if you're gonna work in Alexandria City Public Schools. And we have to make sure we're providing teachers with the necessary supports so that they can always meet the needs of our kids um, in their classrooms. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Hi, Nikki again. Yes. Would you consider building a high school for the west side of Alexandria? Would I consider building a high school for the west side of Alexandria? You know, that's a topic that we're having right now with the high school project. We're talking about one high school or two. And, you know, for me, I believe that, you know, there are implications for either option. And the biggest thing, I think, the biggest driver for me for whichever option um, that actually comes to fruition uh, is that we ensure we have equitable opportunities for all kids. 
in that we're ensuring that kids have choices, that students have the ability to fulfill whatever goals they set for themselves, um, and that we continue to have this plethora of options you know, that we currently have. We have four, over 400 courses that we offer right now here at, um, at T.C. Williams. And that to me is, is a huge gift. Every high school doesn't offer that. Every high school doesn't have this many AP courses that kids are able to sign up for. Um, every high school doesn't even have dual enrollment, you know, or thinking of having an early college uh, where you can obtain your associate's degree before you graduate um, from T.C. Williams High School. So we want to continue to be able to, to offer these options. And I think the main driver is how do we ensure we're providing an equitable learning environment um, for all of our kids and that we are not putting anyone in the situation of having, uh, you know, one school that offers one thing, another school that doesn't offer, one school that looks a certain way, another school that looks different. You know, we need to really accept and embrace the gift of diversity that we have in the city of Alexandria, because um, it is truly a gift for us. Uh, and we want to try to make decisions that won't jeopardize that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Steve Estill, a freshman. Nice um, to meet you. Do you feel that SOLs are an efficient way to test students' knowledge? So, you know, I think that SOLs are just one data point, right? Mm -hmm. I think that for kids, we need to have multiple, for students, we need to have, because you all aren't kids anymore, <laughs> but for students, we need to have multiple data points. Mm -hmm. And we can't just rely on the SOL. And I think that that can tell one piece of the puzzle, but there are so many other more pieces of the puzzle. And um, we have to determine, okay, well, what are those other, you know, academic components that we need to look at to determine students' academic progress? Mm -hmm. Whether it is how they interact with other students, you know, what type of engagement they're a part of that's outside of school, because I think that is an important factor as you're going out into the real world. Mm -hmm. And what are some other ways that you can demonstrate mastery? You know, some kids and some students are just not good test takers. I know I was one of them when I was in school. I always dreaded taking tests, right? But I knew I had to do it. Uh, and I was fortunate I was able to pass my tests, but it took a lot of effort for me um, to, to pass those tests. But if you sat me down and you asked me to explain, um, you know, any type of material, I would be able to explain it to the teacher, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. And, uh, you know, I think we need to put all those uh, learning styles into consideration when we're determining how well a student is or how much academic progress a student has made. So SOLs is one data point uh, for us. We need to use multiple data points to determine uh, how successful our students are. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Hello. I'm Avery Peters, a freshman. Um, what are some positive changes you've seen since you graduated? So some positive changes that I've seen since I've graduated from TC. So I graduated in 1995, a new building. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's one, uh, because I remember at the old building, we would have to run when it was rain. I ran track. So mm -hmm. when it was raining outside, we ran on the top floor, and we used to feel like the top floor was going to collapse every time we ran across um, the building. So one is a new building, right? So I think that is that is a step in the right direction. And then two, all of the additional courses that we offer, you know, here at TC, uh, I felt that we had multiple options when I was in school, when I was a high school student, uh, but we did not have um, as many options as you all have today. Um, and the technology that you all have today, we didn't have that. You know, I was taking typing class at TC when, um, you know, on a typewriter with whiteout. <laughs> and uh, my 12th grade year was when we began to have computer labs, you know, at TC in 90, 94, 95 year. Um, so I think that the, the fact that we have now, you fast forward to today, we have, you know, a better building that is more equipped for the courses that we offer and the more technology um, that we have. And then the fact that we have more diversity here. You know, we were always diverse when I was a student at TC Williams. But I know we didn't have 114 countries represented and 119 languages spoken uh, within our school division. And that to me is probably, I believe, the best gift that you all are going to get going out into the world. Some people do not 
have this type of diverse experience that you can get um, at T.C. Williams before they go to college or before they go out into the world. Some people never get the experience ever, right, because they live in certain areas where the diversity is just not there. Um, our graduates and our students are, you know, really receiving uh, that special gift of, di of diversity. And we still have a lot of work to do, though, in that area, because I can say I believe our hallways are more diverse than our classrooms, right? And what I mean by that is you're going to interact with those 114 countries or people from 114 countries going from class to class. And when you get into your classroom, those 114 countries are not represented. And that is the change we need to see moving forward and ensuring that the true makeup of Alexandria City Public Schools is also represented in our classrooms, in our awards, in our sports, and in everything that we do. Um, so that when you come to Alexandria City Public Schools, regardless of which space you're in, um, that you will see the same diversity that shows up on our division-wide demographics. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Dr. Hutchings, thank you very much. You. Uh, we appreciate your spending the time. It was an enlightening discussion. And we have a, a gift for you. We hope that as you have your morning coffee or tea, that you'll have theogony. it. That you'll have it in a in a theogony mug, in a theo or water. <laughs> yes, that you'll have it in a theogony mug. So thank you very much. It was very enjoyable and, and very informative. And so thank you, journalists, and thanks to everyone watching. So long until next time from T.C. Williams High School.